Of all the branches of the armed forces, few are as hazardous as the submarine service. Every day, naval submariners cram themselves into metal tubes full of explosives and complex machinery and plunge into the icy, crushing depths of the world's oceans. As we have seen in our video, Murphy's Law in Action, the bizarre sinking of the HMS Thetis, in such a hostile environment, even tiny mistakes can lead to disastrous consequences. As a result, many submariners never return home, remaining on eternal patrol. But once in a while, fortune decides to shine on the silent service. In 1939, the same year as the HMS Thetis disaster, an American submarine also sank accidentally during acceptance trials. However, thanks to a combination of luck, quick action, and cutting-edge technology, a large number of her crew were successfully saved from a watery grave. This is the story of the incredible rescue of the USS Squalus. Named after a genus of dogfish shark, USS Squalus was the fifth Sargo-class submarine built for the United States Navy in the late 1930s. Laid down on October the 18th, 1937 at Portsmouth Navy Yard in Kittery, Maine, and launched on September the 14th, 1938, the diesel electric powered Squalus was 93 meters long, 8 meters wide, and displaced 1,300 tons. She was armed with eight 21 inch torpedo tubes and a 3 inch quick firing deck gun, and could cruise at 20 knots surfaced and 9 knots submerged. On March the 1st, 1939, Squalus was commissioned under the command of 34 year old Lieutenant Oliver F. Naquin and soon began acceptance trials off the coast of New England. On the morning of May the 23rd, 1939, Squalus was on station 21 kilometers southeast of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, with four officers, 52 enlisted men, and three civilian naval architects aboard. She was preparing to conduct her 19th test dive, which required her to submerge to a depth of 15 meters in 60 seconds. At 8.35 a.m., the submarine received the order to dive. After radioing in his position, Lieutenant Naquin ordered the ballast tanks flooded and the diving planes angled down, and Squalus slipped gracefully below the waves. At first, all went well with Squalus reaching her target depth in 62 seconds, but moments later, a frantic alert reached the control room. Water was flooding in through the main induction valve used to supply the diesel engines with air while on the surface. The diving officer immediately ordered all ballast tanks blown, but it was too late. Squalus began sinking by the stern and soon settled on the bottom at a depth of 74 meters. Harold C. Preble, the naval architect on board, later described the chaotic scene. I felt a sudden terrific increase in pressure, and I was struck on the back with a volume of water coming in the ventilation line directly over me, driving my head and shoulders down. Water was flowing through the door. Emergency lights went out. Though the crew managed to seal the hatches on the submarine's watertight bulkheads, the four rear compartments quickly flooded, immediately drowning 26 men. The surviving crew members huddled in complete darkness in the forward compartments facing an uncertain fate. It was not until 10.40 a.m. that Rear Admiral Cyrus Cole, Commandant of the Portsmouth Naval Yard, noticed that the Squalus was an hour overdue from her test dive. Assuming the boat's failure to report was merely a case of carelessness, he ordered a radio operator to raise the submarine. When no reply was received, he sounded the alarm. By an extraordinary stroke of luck, Squalus's sister ship, the USS Sculpin, was just then prepping to depart from Portsmouth on a two-month shakedown cruise off South America. Rear Admiral Cole instead ordered her to Squalus's last known position, which she reached around 1 p.m. Unfortunately, Squalus's longitude of 70 degrees, 31 minutes west, had been incorrectly noted by the Portsmouth radio operator as 70 degrees, 36 minutes, meaning Sculpin was some 8 kilometers from the sunken submarine. But after several minutes of searching, a sharp-eyed lookout spotted a red smoke bomb in the distance. Arriving on the scene, Sculpin sailors found an emergency buoy bobbing in the water, launched by the Squalus and connected to the sunken boat by a long telephone cable. Using the telephone receiver contained within the buoy, Sculpin's commander, Lieutenant Warren D. Wilkin, managed to hold a brief conversation with Lieutenant Naquin and Lieutenant J.C. Nichols aboard the Squalus. Wilkin, what's your trouble? Nichols, high induction open, cruise compartment, forward and aft engine rooms flooded. Not sure about aft torpedo room, but could not establish communication with that compartment. Hold the phone and I will put the captain on. Wilkin, how are things? Naquin, consider the best method to employ is to send diver down as soon as possible to close high induction and then hook on salvage lines to flooded compartments and free them of water in an attempt to bring her up. For the present, consider that preferable to sending personnel up with lungs. That moment, the line went dead as a rogue swell suddenly lifted Sculpin, snapping the telephone cable. But Lieutenant Nichols and the U.S. Navy now knew all they needed to know. 
at least 33 of the Squalus' crew had survived and had enough air, food, and water to last them a while. A rescue might be possible. Meanwhile, four more ships were racing to the site of the sinking. Harbor tug USS Pennacook, carrying Rear Admiral Cole and other senior officers, the fleet tug USS Wandunk, the privately owned tug Chandler, and the converted minesweeper USS Falcon, which would serve as the primary rescue vessel. Falcon also carried a complement of highly trained Navy divers equipped with newly developed helium auction diving gear. In addition to that, it also carried the very latest in submarine rescue technology, the McCann Rescue Chamber, developed by engineers Lt. Commander Charles B. Swede Monson and Lt. Commander Alan R. McCann at the Navy's Bureau of Construction and Repair. The chamber was a steel two-compartment diving bell equipped with ballast tanks and a pneumatic winch designed to travel along a steel cable strung between a rescue vessel and the sunken submarine below. A flexible rubber skirt at the bottom of the chamber allowed it to seal itself to one of the submarines Marines escape hatches, whereupon the lower chamber could be pumped free of water and the escape hatch opened. The chamber could carry two operators and seven submariners per trip and was supplied with air, electricity, and telephone communications via an umbilical cable connected to the surface. Though the device had been developed in response to two tragic submarine accidents, the sinking of the USS S-51 in 1925 and the USS S-4 in 1927, the Squalus disaster would be its first true baptism of fire. One of the McCann Chamber's creators, Lt. Commander Charles Mumpson, also invented the Mumpson Lung, the device mentioned by Lt. Naquin in his brief telephone conversation with Lt. Wilkin. The Mumpson Lung also had a type of self-contained breathing apparatus known as a submarine escape set or rebreather, and consisted of a small rubberized canvas bag containing a cylinder of oxygen, a breathing hose, and a mouthpiece, and a small canister of sodium hydroxide. When the sailor breathed through the mouthpiece, the carbon dioxide in their exhaled breath was scrubbed out by the sodium hydroxide canister and the remaining oxygen recycled. This allowed the compact device to provide around a half hour of breathing time, more than enough for a sailor to climb out an escape hatch and rise to the surface. And for a more detailed look at this and other submarine escape sets, please check out the channel Our Own Devices, written and presented by the author of this video and countless more on Today I Found Out and this channel. But while Squalus carried a full complement of Monson lungs, the devices were potentially dangerous to use. If the sailor rose too quickly to the surface or did not breathe properly, they could suffer decompression sickness, aka the bends, or barotrauma, damage to the lungs caused by overexpansion. For this reason, Lt. Naquin decided to wait for the McCann chamber to arrive, reserving the Momsen lungs as an option of last resort. At 3.15 in the afternoon, U.S. Pennacook arrived at the scene, whereupon Rear Admiral Cole took command as a rescue officer. Cole ordered the Pennacook to drop marker buoys 100 yards north and south of the Squalus before dragging the C-4 with a grapnel in order to fix the submarine's exact position. Two hours later, they were joined by the USS Wandank and Private Tug Chandler, who were also ordered to drag for the submarine. Finally, at 9.45, the United States Coast Guard picket boat CG-991 arrived carrying divers from the Navy's Experimental Diving Unit, as well as Lieutenant Commander Charles Mumpson and Lieutenant A.R. Banke, who would direct rescue operations using the McCann Chamber. Once the Pentecook succeeded in fixing and marking Squalus's position, no further rescue attempts were made until the following morning when the USS Falcon finally arrived on the scene. At 10.14 a.m., more than 24 hours after the sinking, Navy diver Martin C. Sabitsky entered the water following the Pentecook's grapnel line down to the Squalus. In another major stroke of luck, Sabitsky landed just two meters aft of the submarine's forward torpedo room escape hatch, allowing him to quickly attach the rescue chamber downhaul cable to a shackle on the hatch rim. As he worked, he could hear the crew inside hammering on the hull, a promising sign. While the Navy's new helium oxygen diving equipment was designed to reduce the risk of both the bends and nitrogen narcosis, aka rapture of the deep, upon his return to the surface, Sabitsky was nonetheless placed in the Falcon's decompression chamber as a precaution. At this point, with the weather rapidly deteriorating, the rescue chamber was quickly lowered into the water with operators Walt Harmon and John Milowski aboard. After a brief stop at 45 meters depth to fix a minor technical issue, the chamber made a soft seal with a Squalus' escape hatch. The chamber was then secured to the hatch with four bolts, the lower compartment pumped dry, and the outer hatch opened. Harmon and Malowski called down to the crew, but there was no reply. For a terrible moment, the rescuers feared they had arrived too late, only to realize that the inner hatch was still closed. 
When this was unsealed, the trap sailors, still very much alive, rushed to the opening to gulp down lungfuls of fresh air from the rescue chamber. You see, as well as the carbon dioxide from the sailor's own breath, the air aboard the Squalus had been fouled with chlorine gas from leaking battery cells. After Harmon and Malowski passed down sandwiches, hot soup, blankets, and flashlights to the survivors, seven submariners, including Lieutenant J.C. Nichols, clambered aboard the chamber and made the 30-minute ascent to the surface. The next two trips carried nine men each, Finally, at 9.13 p.m., only seven men plus Lieutenant Naquin remained aboard. At first, the ascent went normally, but at around 50 meters, the diver sent down to unshackle the downhaul line from the Squalus reported that he was unable to do so and had to instead cut the cable. In response, Falcon attempted to haul up the chamber using its own winch, but this caused the cable to foul and fray inside the chamber's winch mechanism. With the chamber literally hanging by a thread, the decision was made to lower it back to the Squalus until another line could be rigged up. Unfortunately, as Naquin and the last seven sailors waited so close yet so far from rescue, two divers sent down to secure a new line ran into difficulties, becoming entangled in frayed wires and suffering from the effects of nitrogen narcosis. Eventually, the effort was abandoned and the decision was made to raise the chamber using only its onboard ballast tanks. This was an extremely risky plan as the chamber could easily come up beneath the Falcon and collide with its hull. But with no other options available, the chamber's operators slowly piped air into the ballast tanks and began the long ascent back to the surface. Surface. Just after midnight on May the 25th, 1939, 39 hours after the Squalus had gone down, the chamber finally emerged from the water, delivering the submarine's last eight crew members to the surface. Later, the chamber was sent down a fifth time to check Squalus's aft compartments for more survivors, but this only confirmed what many already suspected. The compartments were completely flooded, their occupants long dead. The rescue of the USS Squalus was the most successful operation of its kind in the history of military submarines and caused a media sensation. For their roles in the successful operation, four Navy divers, Chief Machinist Mate William Batters, Chief Boatswain Mate Orson L. Crandall, Chief Metalsmith James H. McDonald, and Chief Torpedo Man John Mowalski would be awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. As for the Squalus, she was eventually raised following a long and troubled salvage operation finally being dry docked on September the 13th, 1939. After being repaired and refitted, she was recommissioned in May of 1940 as the USS Sailfish. During the Second World War, Sailfish made 12 combat patrols in the Pacific Theater, sinking more than 83,000 tons of Japanese shipping. As it was considered bad luck to call a ship by its previous name, Sailfish's first wartime commander, Lieutenant Commander Morton C. Mama Jr., issued orders that any man caught using the name Squalus would be marooned at the next port of call. This led to the crew referring to the boat as Squalefish. In October of 1945, shortly after the end of the war in the Pacific, Sailfish was decommissioned and later scrapped. However, to commemorate her historic status, her conning tower was preserved and put on display at the Portsmouth Navy shipyard, where it remains to this day. While the rescue of the Squalus was the first and only operational use of the McCann Rescue Chamber, this device inspired several generations of more advanced submarine rescue vehicles. Perhaps the most famous of these is the U.S. Navy's Mystic Class Deep Submergence Rescue Vehicle, or DSRV, which was operated from 1971 to 2008 and famously played a key role in the 1991 submarine thriller The Hunt for Red October. Unlike the McCann chamber, the DSRV was a completely independent, self-propelled submersible which could operate without being tethered to a surface ship. Designed to be carried by ship, submarine, or transport aircraft, it could be deployed anywhere in the world within 24 hours. In 2008, the Mystic class was replaced by the Submarine Rescue Diving Recompression System, or SRDRS, which is remotely operated from the surface and includes a decompression chamber to protect rescued crew members from the bends. This technology was, in turn, based on an Australian Navy vehicle called Remora, a name which, while originally referring to the scavenger fish that latches onto other sea creatures, was given the amusing backronym, Really Excellent Method of Rescuing Aussies. Other submarine rescue vehicles in use around the world include the Chinese LR-7, the British LR-5, the Russian Priz class, and the Swedish URF. Yet despite the development of such technology, in the 84 years since the Squalus disaster, no sailor has been successfully rescued from a sunken submarine. In the modern era, submarine accidents are typically so violent or occur in water so deep that there is little chance of anyone surviving to be rescued. This bleak statistic puts in perspective just how lucky those 33 members of the Squalish crew were to have survived their ordeal, and the enormous risk faced every day by the men and women of the silent service.